Hello and welcome everyone. Welcome to Film Snobbery Live. I am your host, Nick Beasley, and uh, I'm here for another episode, uh, actually the final episode for First Glance Film Festival Philly uh, month, and uh, <laughs> that's a lot of F's and PH's and whatnot. Uh, but we've got... a lot of F's in school, aren't you, Nick? What was that? You're used to a lot of F's from school, aren't you, Nick? I am used to a lot of F's. I, I, I am not afraid to, say, to tell everyone. I, I graduated, and when I graduated high school, I graduated, I think it was like 330 kids or something like that or whatever. And I graduated like three from the bo- third from the bottom. And it's just because I hate school. Um, love to learn. Hate the educational structure. But that being said, we're here to not make you learn tonight, or at least not on purpose. We are here to entertain you, and we're going to talk about some great movies tonight. The voice you just heard is my co-host, uh, Jerry Cavallaro, director of Stuck Like Chuck, and uh, the upcoming whatever piece of shit he decides to put out next. Um, so I want to go ahead and, and uh, I want to tell you guys how great of a show we have tonight. I'm very, very excited because not only am I actually prepared to talk to the person we have on the show tonight, because I've actually seen his movie, um, but I've, uh, I've also got a great uh, Indiegogo project of the week that I want to talk to you guys about later on in the show. And, of course, we have a large prize to debut tonight. Uh, is the culmination of our First Glance coverage, uh, here on the show anyway, uh, comes to an end. Um, you guys can also see me at First Glance Philadelphia next week, I think it is. Wow, that came up quick. Next week, um, I'll actually be in Philadelphia at the Franklin Institute um, doing uh, interviews up over up on their red carpet. Hopefully this time we have no technical difficulties and all the tapes and all the other stuff that we have actually uh, record. Uh, so hopefully we can bring you some awesome coverage uh, courtesy of uh, us and the First Glance Film Festival. And uh, hopefully we get all of your stories and, and uh, get to talk to all of you. I'm really, really excited. Um, that being said, we've got uh, film snobberies everywhere this uh, this coming next month or so. Uh, looks like I'm going to be going to the uh, the Maine Film Festival, Portland Maine Film Festival, uh, this weekend. Uh, thanks to some uh, some great people who I just uh, got uh, well, great people, one person actually. Uh, I just got off talking to uh, uh, Crystal Kenville, and she actually asked if we could uh, hashtag the Portland Maine Film Festival, and, and she seems like a, a, a spitfire and, and someone I would really get along well with. So I'm really looking forward to chatting with her um, and, and seeing her there. So it looks like we're going to be covering some stuff there. Uh, then we have uh, First Glance Philly uh, next week, and then right after that, like, we're not even going, ho- I'm not even going home first. I'm making a U-turn, heading up to Staten Island, picking Jerry Cavallaro up, because the man doesn't drive, and then we are trekking on down to the Orlando Film Festival uh, for our another year of uh, Orlando funness. Uh, it'll be cool. Um, I'm really excited to do that. Had a great time last year, and we're going to see what this year brings. Uh, should be interesting, to say the least. So, um, and then uh, in November, I'm going to be heading on over cross country to the Napa Valley Film Festival, and you can uh, catch me there. I'll actually be uh, on a, a film critics panel there, and I'm actually kind of looking forward to that. Um, I'm even in places that I'm not physically at. I'm on the grand jury of the New Hampshire Film Festival this year. I'm really looking forward to, to reviewing and, and checking out some movies there, picking a winner. I always like to pick a winner, uh, and that's what we did on this show today. We actually have a, w- a big winner, big big winner on our show this this uh, this week. Uh, we have actor, uh, writer, and, and producer. Parker Croft, uh, whose movie Falling Overnight, uh, movie stars in Falling Overnight, um, is actually going to be playing at the First Glance Philadelphia Film Festival. I've actually seen this movie when it was playing out in Rhode Island. Um, Really, really enjoyed it. I'm actually going to show you guys the trailer for this movie right now. And uh, when we come back, we're going to talk with the man himself, uh, Parker Croft, and uh, about his movie and his uh, experiences and and, uh, what makes him tick. So uh, stick around. We'll be right back. uh, And uh, it'll be fun. So... Awesome. and I'm the director of Fallen Overnight. I had the opportunity to co-write the film with these two gentlemen right here. Hey, I'm Aaron Golden. I'm Parker Croft, and, and we'd all like to welcome you to the Falling Overnight plus movie theaters equals great idea campaign. <laughs> yes. Um, basically, our goal is to raise enough money to give Fallen Overnight a theatrical release. We want to be in some select cities this spring, and hopefully many, many more after that. 
Bong Over Night tells the story of Elliot Carson on the day before he has surgery to remove a brain tumor. Facing what could be his last night, Elliot crosses paths with Chloe Webb, a young photographer who takes him on an incredible journey through a Los Angeles summer night. I'll hear your voice, clear as a bell. I can't However, as the morning approaches, Elliot reveals the truth about his condition, and the two of them must together face their uncertain future. We've all been affected by illness, and really we were just interested in exploring the complex and really sometimes surprising emotions and experiences that someone deals with when they're suffering from an illness. I mean, that said, Falling Overnight isn't just a movie about illness. It's also a celebration of life and love and the wondrous potential of any given night. We knew we were making a risky film when we started out with a tiny budget, no established stars, and a script that prized honest human moments over more traditional structure. Yeah, but the response has been, you know, overwhelming and we've managed to win some awards and with your help we could get it into theaters. Uh, and we know, it sucks when people ask you for money. It seems like everybody's always coming after you all with their little spider fingers, but um... Please consider donating to Falling Overnight and empowering Falling Overnight. Any amount of money you guys can give us is amazing from one dollar to many, many, many dollars. Basically the bottom line is we can't do this alone. We definitely need your help. You will be so proud of the movie that you are a part of and we can make this happen. Okay, we're back, and I want to introduce now, uh, ladies and gentlemen, our guest for the evening, Mr. Parker Croft. Hey, what's going on? Hey, sorry, I played the Kickstarter uh, uh, trailer first. Uh, I, I mis mislabeled them as I put them in my uh, my software here. But um, but that being said, you guys are, are doing a little Kickstarter deal here. Yeah, yeah, we are. We're doing uh, we're doing a Kickstarter campaign to get the film into uh, into a theatrical release. Awesome, awesome. So, the, what's the uh, what 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 kind of uh, brought the brought that into kind of being like you know in terms of why theatrical versus you know anything else i mean i've seen the movie i saw it on the big screen so i can definitely vouch for the you know and i saw it in the ideal way i was on a date that's a, it's a date movie definitely um you know but but uh do you know, is there you know is there kind of a method to the madness yeah um i mean i i think that the the movie is a very intimate movie and so um, I mean, it plays, it plays maybe more powerfully in a theater than it would on, you know, uh, online or something smaller. Um, and so we, we really wanted to give the film the opportunity to be seen in its most powerful format. Uh, and so that's why we wanted to give it a theatrical release. Now, you, uh, you're actually the co-writer on this film as well as the lead actor and the executive producer, one of the executive producers. Where, you know, you, you co-wrote the story with Aaron, uh, Aaron Golden, right? Uh, well, there and, and actually with the director as well, uh, Conrad Jackson. Okay, and how, how, did, the, how did you, got, uh, you three get together to collaborate to, to make this story? Um, well, actually, uh, all right, well, it's kind of a story. Um, so Conrad uh, and I had worked on a pilot together um, a couple of years ago, uh, and Conrad and I sort of clicked. We had a pretty good working relationship, and, and at one point uh, we started talking about um, creating a movie together. Um, and he came to me with this uh, time-constrained piece about, uh, you know, a young man over one night sort of dealing with his mortality and um, it had somewhat sort of uh, vague parameters but it was like it was a really interesting idea um, and so from there uh, I would worked with another friend of mine Aaron Golden before on a couple short films and I thought you know hey Aaron's one of the best writers I know let's bring him on board too uh, and the three of us sat down and um, we all just clicked and it it was you know, a, a pretty intense couple month writing session followed by, you know, over a year of making the movie and stuff, you know. Cause, but, yeah, that's pretty much the story. Because it's funny because it's almost like you guys had, like, the 50-50 movie before 50-50 came out. 
and and you know, uh, you know it kind of has a lot of you know, has some comedic elements to it. It has some dramatic elements to it. It deals with a guy battling, you know, uh, uh, an, an Ill, you know an illness, a uh, cancer, or tumor of some sort. And you know, it's uh, you know, are you are you angry that Seth Rogen copied you? No. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, I actually I haven't seen Fifty Fifty yet, um, so I I don't know uh, how similar it is. I mean, I think there's probably a lot of crossover for sure. I mean, um, I no, I think, you know, it's a mortality with the young is a really interesting subject. I mean, it's 50 50s one. I mean, Gus Van Sant's new movie deals with a similar subject. I mean, mortality, youth and love. Those are the big ones, right? So like, those are the things that uh, attract a lot of film writers and, and filmmakers. So, you know, Hey, I'm, I'm glad other people are tackling this. It's a, it's a good it's a good subject to tackle. No, and and it was done in a really in a really touching way. You really kind of captured the the um, you know obviously you you kind of compacted everything into like one night and and it almost you see the the way this relationship is. It's funny because it also to me even when I watched it didn't seem forced, which I really liked. Um, it was just it was just really really uh it was a heartfelt movie and and, uh, and again like you said um youth and mortality is a really interesting subject because young people don't ever really think about that you know until it's literally either put in their face or usually it's when it's it's you know through like a loved one or something like that um yeah man it's 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 an interesting subject to tackle and and you guys you know that's no easy feat to do that with you know to make younger people care about something like that but i really think that you guys did a, a great job in in getting that um you know bringing those emotions out and and getting the the performances are great i mean i'm not just saying that because you're the lead actor either um <laughs> i'd have been like that blonde kid blonde haired kid he sucked no um <laughs> <laughs> no, you did a really good job, and your your co-host is uh, amazing. Uh, not co-host, your co co-star is amazing. I'm kind of a co-host of the movie, you know. Yes, always... exactly. Um, see, now if if Jerry was smart, he would have picked right up and said, "Wow, Nick, that was a slip of the tongue." No, it wasn't. Um, <laughs> but uh, but no, man. It, what? How did you guys? Were you involved in? You know, obviously having been one of the co-writers and executive producers and stuff, were you involved at every step as well, along with the director and, and, and you know, getting the thing cast and shot and all that? I mean, how, how, did, what, how did that come into play? Um, yeah, no, I, I was, I was uh, present in every step of the process, from, you know, writing to uh, casting the film to, you know, obviously the film itself to I was in the editing room and... And, you know, and now I've been working, you know, sort of uh, as a producerial role, like getting the film out there and trying to get it into theaters. Um, a, a lot, I mean, Aaron Golden as well has been doing a lot of that work. Um, we're a really, really small team, so, uh, you know, it's, it's, there's five of us. There's myself, uh, our two producers, Jed Ryan and Elizabeth Jackson, and our director, Conrad Jackson, and, and Aaron Golden. So we're all sort of taking on multiple roles to get this thing done. Now, the, the film itself takes place over the span of a day, and a, well, and a, mostly a night. How long did, it act, did production actually take on this movie? Um, I mean, yeah, days of shooting, there were, there were uh, 14 uh, days of shooting. Uh, most of them were, you know, 12-hour-plus nights, but... Um, yeah, that, yeah, 14 production days. Nice. And how long did, you know, in terms of pre-production, about how long did it take you guys before you were ready to, to start rolling, uh, you know, rolling day one? Well, we were under some pretty severe uh, time constraints because Conrad Jackson, who was graduating from uh, LMU at the time, was had the ability to get us uh, student filming permits, which is a way that we made the film for much cheaper than we could have made it for um, other reasons, mm -hmm. like uh, in the normal way. So we, I mean, we wrote the script in about, I'd say, I mean, two plus months. And then we were tuning it, you know, during filming and right before filming. Pre-production was, I don't know, I mean, pre-production was kind of uh, <laughs> a month, I'd say. And then, and then post has really sort of took a very, very long time. The post was brutal. Now, yeah. you, you have a couple of, well, uh, quite a few scenes in the flick where you're, you're dealing with um, larger crowds of people. There's one kind of party scene. There's a, uh, another where, you know, you guys are up in the, the hills there and you're, um, you're kind of hanging out and stuff like that. And, 
um, you know, kind of a group of people and stuff like that. Do you, is it is it difficult uh, filming a, a group of people like that? Even if the scene is only focusing on one or two of those people, is it is it difficult to, to film uh, and keep everyone else that's kind of in the, the the scene kind of interested in what their their role is in that? Um. Well, I, I, I wouldn't say the difficulty is in keeping people interested because the people that are there, I mean, they want to be there. It's, it's, a, it's a passion project, so people, people that are there are very excited about making art that they care about. Um, I mean, I'd say the, the larger scenes, a lot of the difficulty probably was on Conrad's shoulders and that there were a lot more pieces to keep track of. So. Um, I mean, for me, the crowd scenes weren't more difficult than the non-crowd scenes because that wasn't as much my responsibility. Okay. You know, I, I just, uh, from your perspective, too, even trying to focus on, you know, from an acting perspective, trying to focus on, uh, you know, these intimate scenes with other people kind of milling about and stuff like that, is it, you know, I mean, literally, you're there, there it's a party, you know, in, in both cases, um, a get-together, as it were, and, and you know, is, is it difficult to, to kind of keep focus on, uh, as an actor, on when there's other stuff going on? I know I have a little bit of, like, ADD when it comes to, you know, like, um, even in the show, like, I've got a, a chat room over here, and I've got notes here, and I've got, you know, Know, a preview screen and another screen over here. As soon as one thing flashes in my field of vision, I completely forget that I'm even talking to you. Um. <laughs> no, you've got a lot of things going on. It's like I can see, obviously. There's like a little box there and there's a lot going on. So, I mean, I would say you're doing a pretty good job keeping track of most of this stuff. But, um, yeah, no, I, for the acting, I, I mean, I'd say the most challenging scenes for me were sort of the, the apex scenes in the movie. Mm -hmm. Um that I won't talk about because I don't want to spoil it for people, but um, there are there are scenes towards the end of the movie that for me were the most challenging. Did you yeah. have any um, any experience with anyone um, going through something similar to what your character went through in the, the movie that you could pull kind of the emotion uh, from or, or anything like that, uh, you know, for some of those, those key sequences? Yeah, well, I actually, I, I did... Um, uh, several interviews with uh, people that had, had not oligodendroglioma, but um, other brain surgeries. Um, I actually I watched a couple brain surgeries online to see just what they what the actual procedure looks like. I did a lot of research on it. Um, uh, and then as far as um, being connected with people that have had illness, um, yeah, I, I, I have uh, intimate relationships with people that have gone through um, illness and and I could certainly pull things from that as well. And what, you know, were, did, did you do most of that research as you were writing it, or more so, I mean, was there a separation between writing the movie and kind of researching your, the role for yourself as you were going to act it, or were, when you were writing this, was it more of like you were writing it for you, so, you know, you kind of already had everything, kind of your, your was it easier to write your mannerisms into the script and stuff like that? Um, no, I would say uh, surprisingly that I mean that's kind of what I assumed would happen. But there's for me anyway, there was much more of a compartmentalization that happens when I'm a writer. That is my responsibility, and I and I I wrote um, you know from the third person. That wasn't a, me that I was writing. That was a, a character that I was writing. And then when I became sort of when I took on the acting role of that, um, I really melted away from the writing responsibilities and that really fell on the shoulders of Aaron and, and somewhat of Conrad. Um, but Conrad was, of course, very, very focused on the directing then. Mm -hmm. and, and so, yeah, there's a lot of compartmentalization, I'd say, that happens in the process. Now, let's, let's, uh, let's go back a little bit further away from Falling Overnight for a second, and let's, let's talk about kind of how you got your start. Um, you, you, we were talking a little bit before the show, and you've, you've done some traveling around, you know, and, and stuff like that. How, what kind of landed you uh, into acting, you know, kind of where you are now? Um, well, I, you know, I got into acting in the way that a lot of kids get into acting. I did, you know, theater as a kid, and, um, you know, I, I loved I loved it. I loved the attention. You know, I loved, <laughs> I, you know. There's pretty girls. There's, you know, it's a, it's a good scene when you're a kid and you're acting. Um, and then from there, I, you know, I I did a little bit of professional theater before high school. But in high school, I did very very little acting. Actually, I um, I I didn't do any acting. You know, my freshman and sophomore year. And then senior year, I 
I started writing a play and acted in a play that I produced, and then um, I I moved to New York and, and, and decided to uh, pursue it professionally. I went to a conservatory in New York, and uh, one thing led to another, and I got a manager that brought me out to L.A., and and started working in LA. Now, I, I think a lot of people might find it interesting to know, like, how did, how do you land a manager? How do you find get people that are interested enough to either represent you or to, to, uh, to you know, get attached to your career to, to, to kind of drive you forward? I think that's one of the questions that I think everyone asks: is How do I get representation? How do I get, you know, um, how do I get people to notice the work that I do? I mean, the, you know. I deal with with filmmakers every day, and 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 uh, you know, at, by extension, actors and actresses and stuff like that. And it's it's probably one of the the, the more frequently asked questions that I get. It was it you know was it something where it, right place right time was it a you know um, you know you you were you know as they say kind of in the the Wayne Gretzky parlance you know you went where the puck you know it, it was going to be not where it was. Or... Um, you know, it's it's yeah, it's a uh, it's a tricky it's a tricky question. I honestly have no idea how how anyone gets a manager. It's uh, it seems to be a, a crapshoot. Um, you you either find someone that uh, somehow you find someone that thinks that they can make money off of you, or you don't. Um, and uh, I mean that's that's kind of the simplest version. I mean, the, as far as like you can, I mean, I'm a, I'm a huge, huge proponent of make it yourself. Uh, you know, don't, don't be discovered. Uh, like, like make, make something that can be worth something and, and not sort of Almost kind of like don't don't wait for them to come to you, but, but, you know, make, make them, uh, don't make them discover you, but make them come to you. Well, right. I mean, it's, there's a lot of people that are works in progress, and I mean everyone's a work in progress. But if you can, you can say, all right, well this is what I can do instead of this is what I will do. I promise, um, you're going to have, I guess, a different level of value to someone that wants to make money off of it. You know, and, and that being said, how does it feel to 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 be to almost have a value put on your your work like that? And in terms of, I mean. When you work in in the arts and stuff like that, whether you're an actor or writer or whatever, um, I think that there's a big perception of of just kind of like you know I'm doing it because I want to do it. You know, it's what I want to do with my life and stuff. And yes, we all want to do it for money. But is it kind of a funny feeling when someone else has a perceived value of what they feel that you're worth to them in terms of how they make their living? Yeah, I mean, yeah, no, it's. It's it's super weird to have. I mean, in any career, whether it's the arts or anything, it's super weird to say that you're worth this much. Yeah. Uh, in, in general, I mean, I, I I think that you know it's somewhat of a meet in the middle. You determine your value, uh, and then uh, if someone says, "I think your value is this." You say, "I think my value is this," and someone's gonna agree, or you're not gonna work. So. <laughs> <laughs> And, and, and uh, we actually have a question from the audience here. Uh, John Hoff actually asked, uh, do, I'm going to expand upon it a little bit too. Do, do agents have an actor or agents or managers have an actor's best interest at heart? I would think that the answer would be yes because that's their paycheck. But I'm going to expand that slightly to also say, you know, when they, how do they uh, get people interested in you? I mean, you know, how do you, how do you, how do they get you these meetings? Is it worth it to have you know that person in your corner, uh, just for the, the the sheer fact that you know you have someone working on your behalf when you're maybe busy on another shoot or doing an interview like this or whatever it is. I mean, um, yeah. To, honestly, to be, I mean, uh, hmm, it's tricky. I, I, <laughs> it's I, tricky because he might be listening. <laughs> I actually recently um, fired uh, my representation because uh, I. I wasn't um, I wasn't thrilled with sort of what I was getting from them. Mm -hmm. uh, so um, yeah, I mean, does does an agent have an actor's best interest at heart? Uh, um, I don't I don't think any agent has any best actor's best interest at heart because your best interest is to be uh, you know a happy, healthy, successful. Uh, <laughs> you know, artist, and that doesn't always mean making the most amount of money. I mean, sometimes it does mean making a huge amount of money, but um, an, an, agent's, an agent is a businessman, just like a producer is a businessman, and mm -hmm. a producer wants to get the movie made more than they want to have you feel good. 
Right. Uh, right. So, I mean, does an agent want you to make a lot of money so they can make a lot of money? Yes. If that is your best interest, then yes, an agent has your best interest in mind. Do you do you f look at your career and what you do as an actor as a business person or as a creative person in terms of, um, you know, I, I, do you leave the business to, to people, to representation, like the business of acting to representation and stuff like that, or do you take the reins on, on that part of your career as well, and, and, you know, does it ever get in the way with the creative aspect of what you do? Um, no, I, I absolutely, absolutely don't uh, give the reins up to someone else. Um, I don't think I don't think that's smart to do for anyone. Um, no one is going to just sort of take care of the numbers for you. You have to be a hawk. I mean, look, bank accounts constantly mess things up. I mean, like, people are constantly getting their credit cards stolen and stuff, and you would assume that a bank would get it perfectly all the time, but they don't. And, like, as a human, you have to be... A smart, business savvy, intelligent person. You can't just be this sort of, uh, you know, whimsical artist and not care about money because you need money to eat. Yes, yes, I could do with missing a few, uh, a few things. I guess that's uh, a few meals. I, I guess my success is caught up to me at this point. Um, no, I'm kidding. I wish. Uh, <laughs> but, um, but you know, no, it's it's really kind of an interesting thing because I, acting is one of those. I see acting almost as one of those businesses where you, um, because there is no backdoor uh, type of, I don't want to say backdoor action, that just sounds horrible, but there really isn't in terms of like, you know, your work is literally up in front of, you know, you, you have to prove your worth on every move, movie that you do or every piece of work that you do, and it's all up in front for everybody to see. It literally speaks for itself. Um, it, 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 it's kind of hard to negotiate your, you know, I, I would think that it would be very difficult to negotiate a better role when your last role was shit. Oh, yeah, no, I mean, I'm a strong proponent in that you're as good as your last piece of work. Um, I, I think that, you know, it's, it's, it's not, it doesn't benefit anyone to sort of say, oh, um, that was good and that this wasn't good, but you can see that I can do good work. No, do good work every time. I mean, I've done a lot of bad work in my life, and, and I think falling over is good work, and um, I don't know, that's, you I know, wouldn't, yeah. You don't have to, and you don't, definitely don't have to name uh, names or titles or anything like that, but has there ever been any work that you've done that you've asked kind of, you know, after the fact, like, would you mind if we just don't put my name on this, or, or if, you know, do you manage your your career and manage your image as, you know, as both an actor or a brand or however you want to, you want to say it. Um, do you manage that it, it, to that level? I mean, where you're just like, no, th you know, we'll, this counts and this doesn't, so to speak. Um, no, I mean, like, uh, I've never said, like, take my name off that. I've certainly been, there's definitely many things I've, uh, many, uh, not many things, but there's work that I've done that I've been ashamed of and I'm not proud of it. And um, that just goes with learning. I mean, I, I, I like. There's a lot of crap that everyone's gonna do when you learn how to do something good. I mean, I, I, I mean, I'm, I'm sure in, you know, 15 years, I'm, I'm gonna want to, you know, look back on falling over night and say, ah, oh, this wasn't as good as I wanted it to be, or whatever. That's just part of growing, I think. Uh, and, and you know what, though, I think that in my opinion as a film critic, which trumps your opinion as an ad, uh, an actor, um, that uh, no, I certainly think that falling overnight. I think you're going to look back on that in 15 years and say that was a great movie. Where, uh, where, that's nice. No, that's it, nice. it's no. I mean, yeah. Of course, all actors are like insanely self-conscious people. You know, you can't take my word for it. <laughs> <laughs> No, you. I, I, I really enjoyed this movie, and, and uh, in terms of, you know, you guys are doing a Kickstarter campaign to get this out to, uh, you know, get it out to theaters and stuff like that. Uh, hopefully, you know, even, we all obviously hope you guys succeed. Um, if, if for some reason you don't, I, I hope that it continues to do well on the festival circuit. Hopefully, you know, uh, screening series, independent screening series out there like mine and, and uh, you know, what Film Courage does with their interactives and, and these other places, these little small pockets of indie film people out in the the you know the rest of the country hopefully they pick up on it as well and they um, you know they 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 uh, contact you guys or you contact them to to get it played in front of audiences because you're right it definitely plays well in front of a crowd and having um, 
Uh, and also, you know, that, it's a, I will say it's a great date movie. Didn't work for me for lack of trying. Um, uh, but uh, it's only because the girl I went out with when I saw it happened to have a boyfriend at the time. Those things happen, I guess. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, man, it was, it, it's, it's a great flick. Now, what do you have coming up, um, you know, next in, in terms of whether it's uh, other acting gigs or where else is uh, Fallen Overnight going to be? Um, well, yeah, I'm, I'm traveling around a bit. Uh, I go to I go to Jack's Film Festival. I want to try and figure out if I can come to uh, First Glance. I don't know. If that's going to be a coin toss. But um, Jack's Film Fest uh, in Jacksonville, Florida. I'm going to that on the 15th. And then we have our L.A. premiere, I think. Oh, I don't know if I'm allowed to talk about that, though. <laughs> we, we may or may not have an L.A. premiere coming up on the... Uh, on the November yeah. ish times, mm -hmm. um, may or may not ish. So you know, if you're in LA in November ish, in LA ish, we'll be we'll be talking more about <laughs> once that's 100 percent locked in. Cool. Uh, and I'm going to Stockholm uh, for the Stockholm International. That's our international premiere, and I'm doing that. Um, in November, for sure. <laughs> now, did you did you have any um, any say in the, the the process of what film festivals that you guys were going to apply to? Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, and, and what what um, what appealed? What was the appeal for First Glance for you guys? I figured might as well work a plug in for them. Um, <laughs> uh, First Glance, it seems like a, a pretty good Philadelphia film festival. It seems uh, like they we're into indie films and that we might have a, you know, they're not a huge festival, so we could potentially get some good coverage there. And um, we got in, we were excited that they were excited and it, it's sort of, uh, that's, that's how it works. I mean, you know, film festival that, that loves your film that you love, that's a match made in heaven. So, um, Let's see here. Survey says, no, I'm sorry. We would have accepted uh, because First Glance shows really high-quality independent films, and we feel that our film, Falling Overnight, is of that caliber of film. So we wanted to make sure that, uh, you know, we were rocking out with our socks out at uh, First Glance Philly. And I believe that was the number one answer we were looking for. Oh, geez. <laughs> uh, but for those other folks out there that want to win some cash and prizes, um, we do have a contest coming up uh, towards the uh, middle of the show here. Um, I, Parker, I want to go ahead real quick. I'm gonna th I am going to hopefully uh, successfully play the actual trailer to, uh, to Falling Overnight in a moment. Uh, are you going to stick around for a, m a minute until we come back? And we'll... Uh, yeah, yeah, I'll stick around. I'm just hanging out. <laughs> it's, it, that's what we do, man. And uh, All right, yeah, so we'll be right back. We're going to hopefully show you the full trailer to Falling Overnight at this point. Um, hopefully I, I didn't actually put the same clip twice, but I guess we'll see that. Uh, we'll be right back. Obviously, no eating after 10 p.m. tonight. How about you tell me what's going on? I called Ali, got down drug we don't want. Too
people so, talk about how you're supposed to live as if you're gonna die tomorrow and stuff like that. But if you think about it, it's a very stressful way to live. And we're back with uh, executive producer, actor, and co-writer of Falling Overnight, Parker Croft. Um, I want to that, look at that. We got, we got a lot of really good responses here for that tra from your trailer here on uh, on, on the, the chat room. Uh, Red Locker says good good soundtrack in this trailer. Uh, uh, Crystal Kenville actually says agreed, love it. Uh, and she also says the actors are intriguing. And where was this filmed? Uh, it was just filmed in L.A. It was filmed in L.A., huh? Yeah. Nice, and and we actually do have a uh, we have a couple other things too. John did uh, John Hoff actually did say, "Will Falling Overnight have a screening in Boston?" Oh, can't hear you. It went away for a second. Oh, can you hear me now? Uh, like a Verizon commercial. Oh no! Right now, can you hear me now? That's better. Okie doke. Yeah, um, we screened at Snob, which is actually in New Hampshire, but it's it's north of Boston. Yeah, so, um, somewhere north of Boston, yeah. That's what it's called, I believe, yeah. Um, we How? haven't screened in Boston yet, though, no. I mean, of course, we would love to screen in Boston. It's just, it, uh, it, hasn't, it hasn't fallen in line yet. And but, uh, the next, <laughs> yeah, I mean, we'll, we'll hopefully someone up here in this neck of the woods maybe a film snobbery type of entity might be interested in screening that movie. Um, <laughs> but uh, also, Crystal Kenville even says, should you want to do a showing in Maine, let her know. Oh, well, please get in touch with us on, uh, on send us an email at info at fallingovernight.com. We will hook it up. <laughs> and First Glance Film says, "Stop stealing our alumni." And I'll, I'll stop stealing them when you stop when you stop getting them, Bill. Um, <laughs> uh, but uh, and and so you filmed uh, you did film up in L.A. and the, in the it looked like you were out up in the hills. Yeah, that was actually um, that's that's uh, above the sign, and uh, it's it's on the same sort of mountain range as. That famous Hollywood sign. It, was it up kind of like near, more towards like um, the Griffith Observatory area? or Because I know that you, it's hard to get up by that sign in terms of like, they have it that kind of like locked off, don't they? Uh, yeah, they do. I mean, it's not actually by the sign. It's, um, it's, if, you, if you're familiar with the topography of Los Angeles, it's, uh, it's in between uh, the Warner Brothers studio and the... Uh, uh, basically uh, north of that, the hills north of that. Um, it's a, it's a, a very hard hike, about 45 minutes up there, and, and uh, we had to haul all the equipment up there to film that scene. But, um, yeah, it was it's a beautiful scene, I think, so it was worth it. Oh, totally, man. No, it, it's, it's, it is really nice. Um, no, I... I that there's a couple things I really liked about the flick. The cinematography and the locations are one of them. The other one has already been mentioned here in the the chat room, and, and maybe you could touch upon it a little bit. Soundtrack, um, cool soundtrack. Where did you get it from? Um, well, I I actually uh, handpicked the soundtrack with Aaron Goldman, our music supervisor, Marcella. Uh, well, I'm gonna butcher this. Wojcik, I believe. <laughs> Uh, so yeah, basically, um, we we were we we decided to make all of the music diegetic, which for non-film type people that means that it's coming from something actually in the scene, mm -hmm. uh, like a like a boombox that's actually in the scene. It's not like overture. It's kind um, of like what uh, what Tarantino does in a lot of his like they did that in Reservoir Dogs uh, in in a couple of scenes. Um, you know. Uh, or uh, I think they also did that in, in um, uh, uh, Pulp Fiction to a, to a degree. Basically the opposite of a montage. Montage plays over everything. This plays in the scene. Gotcha. So um, when, you have, when you're scoring a movie with diegetic music, um, that presents the problem of needing a lot of music cues. Mm -hmm. uh, and so we had... Very little money, um, and we had to get 26 music cues, um, and we managed to get our uh, 26 amazing songs for under ten thousand dollars. So that was a pretty, pretty and, big feat for us. And did you did you go ahead and get? Is it full on um, music licensing, music rights for it? You know, not just like festival yeah. licensing, all that. 
All acquired, yeah. No, we nice. didn't just get festival licensing. We, we own all media. Now, were you guys really aware of making sure that you met, like, th you know, pretty much whatever you would need for your deliverables if you were to be approached by, say, like a distributor or anything like that? I mean, do you have pretty much everything ready to go at a moment's notice if someone came up and said, I want to I wanna take this movie and I want to put it out? Well, yeah, we, we wanted to get all our deliverables in order, and we did. I mean, there's there's nothing overhanging the movie. Um, so, I mean, I, I, I think that'll be good um, for, I mean, we're, it's, it's highly, highly likely that we will be doing a spring theatrical release, so. Nice. Um, now, is that, is that with a distributor, possibly, maybe, or is that a self-release, or what's your... It's going to be a self-release with our, with our Kickstarter. Um, I mean, if anyone wants to check out our Kickstarter page, it's, it's what we need to make this movie get out there, but... Yep. Go ahead, uh, I'll, have, I'll make sure Jerry go ahead and get a, a link for that into the chat room, their Kickstarter page. Uh, if, for those of you guys who aren't, uh, you know, because um, it, it's kind of a long uh, link. I don't like the way that Kickstarter does their links. Um, but you can always go ahead and go on Kickstarter.com and search for Falling Overnight. But Jerry, I'm going to have you go ahead and get a, uh, a link there in the, the chat room for us. We're also going to be posting like a bunch of update videos from festivals that we've been to and exclusive backer-only videos. Um, the one video that, oh, I can't talk about it yet, but it's, it's going to be posted very soon, and, and it's very good. It's a backers-only video. Um, awesome. Yeah. I like backers only videos. I'm I'm a big fan of, of, of exclusivity for people that are so that's that support you. Um, I agree. I say if you're supporting the arts, you should get to experience all of the art. Absolutely, man. Now, do you when when you, how do you decide as an actor or even as I guess a producer or a writer or anything like that? How do you decide kind of what projects are right for you? I mean, have you ever turned down a project, even something that was paying you, um, you know, just because you're like, you know, I, I just don't think I'm the right person for this. Yeah, yeah, I have. Uh, um, I, especially now that I, I mean, I'm by no means, you know, a, a successful filmmaker yet, but um, I now that I've created uh, my own projects um, with a team that I feel passionate about and created a film that I'm proud of, I would say my tolerance for films that I'm not proud of is has gone down so um, yeah it's 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 harder and harder for me to do things that I I'm not passionate about because they all take so much time and so much of your life energy mm -hmm. that I mean it's hard to do them if you don't love them I'm really happy to hear you say that too because I mean even for what what I do here and what we do here at film snobbery I feel exactly the same way it's like why why put so much time and energy into something that either A, you're not passionate about, or B, isn't working, just because, you know, um, it's, it's, it's kind of even one of those things, like I used to say with, with filmmakers, at, at, like my seminar I did at, at South by Southwest, it was called Your Baby is Ugly. Um, it's just like, you know, know when to back away and, and see it for what it is. And just because, you know, you're passionate about it doesn't mean other people aren't. Um, it also means that, you know, it might not necessarily be the right time or the right project for you, you know, at, at this time. Because it does take so much time, and it's a lot, it's, it's time, it's money, it's, it's, yeah. it's effort out of your life, man. It's, it's a lot of stuff, you know. I mean, we go through that all the time. Um, you know, for us, it's just like, where, where is myself as a resource best put? And it's not always here in front of the camera. It's not always working on the website or doing reviews. It's not always, you know, it's, it's, it's funny, man. You got to, you know, you can only, there's only so much of you to go around. Only so much of you. And, like, life is short. Don't spend three years doing something that you don't like at all. Like, <laughs> might as well, you might as well love it. I mean... I'm, I'm, it's actually been a pretty interesting process. We're writing a new script right now, and it's, I mean, we, we, we wrote Falling Overnight in roughly three months. Um, and the new script that we're writing will take a year to write because we, we want it to be as absolutely good as it can possibly be before we start filming it. Um, which, um, you know, I it's a, it's a it's a a change. You know, I mean, we were constricted with time falling overnight, and we're very very proud of it. But 
um, as you move forward, you, there's things that you've learned. Do you feel that falling overnight is going to be a good, uh, using is like a really good calling card for, you know, uh, yourself as an actor, for, mm -hmm. you know, uh, in, for all, all of you guys as writers and producers and directors and stuff like that? Do you, do you feel that that's going to be something that, you know, as you move on to this next project, that you'll be able to show this to an investor, you'll be able to show it to somebody who might be able to contribute to this film in a meaningful way? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, Falling Overnight is, is my baby. I love Falling Overnight. It's, I live with it. I've lived with it every day for well over a year. And I, I absolutely couldn't be more proud of it. And I think it would be a good, a good resource as we try and uh, pool, you know, interest for our new film. Nice. And, and I got to tell you, I mean, I... You, you have you had a movie with a lot of heart, great acting. Uh, obviously, again, your co-star is is quite attractive. She basically she kind of reminds me of like a a younger um, a younger Anne Hathaway who didn't go through that awkward phase in the middle of the Princess Diaries. Um, you know, she kind of has a you know, really nice personality, which. I, I, if it's acting, then she's a great actress, but I think that a lot of her personality seems to, it felt natural. And you only you would know that because you were on set with her, but uh, when the cameras weren't rolling. But um, but yeah, man, it, it just, everything felt, uh, very, everything you did felt very real. And, and I like movies, especially independent movies, who that, that don't have the, um, the budgets to do, you know, a you know, 20, 30, 40 takes and don't have the time and, and or the materials or whatever, um, that when you can get a really good synergy between the writing, the acting, the directing, the cinematography and pull out really true performances uh, organically, um, those movies I, I really have a deep respect for. And, and, and that was uh, kind of how I felt even when I, was, when I was coming out of Falling Overnight. I really I enjoyed it. I, if, I had to, if I had to say that you know, any negative comment to it, it felt a little long at some points, but I don't think that that's necessarily a, um, a detriment when I'm considering the movie as a whole. Excellent. Well, I mean, honestly, thank you so much for all the kind words you said about it, man. I really appreciate it. No, and I want to thank you for, for coming on the show tonight, and uh, I won't keep you any longer, but I do want to go ahead and I want to plug a bunch of stuff for you. Obviously, the Kickstarter campaign that you're, they're doing, Jerry did go ahead and put a link, he put a link up on the chat room uh, for us uh, and for you guys out there. Please go ahead, donate, and again, uh, we're going to say it later on the show with our Indiegogo project of the week, but I'm going to say it again now. If you can't donate money, please donate time. Give it a, a, a like on Facebook, give it a tweet, give it a plus one on Google, whatever you want to do. Um, just get it out there, um, and and uh, you know, obviously they've got uh, some some uh, donator uh, donating, don't whatever. Uh, pre some exclusive uh, uh, content for those who do donate. So if you want to exp explore more of the world of falling overnight, uh, please go ahead, give them a buck or two, and uh, or more, um, and go ahead and uh, you know support indie film that way. Um, you can learn more about uh, the film as a whole at www.fallingovernight.com. It'll also let you know where uh, they're going to be next, and um, you know they'll have other uh, links and stuff like that for the casting crew. Tra you can watch the trailer again if you want to watch it. If you don't want to watch it here over and over, you can go there and watch it over and over. Um, and uh, you can go ahead uh, follow them on Twitter at uh, twitter.com/fallnightmovie. Uh, and uh, facebook.com slash falling overnight as well. So, uh, and how about you, Parker? Any any uh, exclusive kind of website for you or your work? Um, you know what? I mean, I you know I have a Facebook page, but it's all just falling overnight stuff. Or, or just be like, you know what? Hit me up on IMDb where the pros go. <laughs> I mean, yeah, you can hit me up there. Um, I do. I do just want to say thank you so much for having me as a guest uh, and, and and helping plug the movie. I really appreciate it. No, um, I, I appreciate you taking the time, man. I know there's a little time difference going back and forth uh, from here to LA, and, and it's you know I'm really glad that you were able to take time out of you know making uh, you know more movies and acting and just everything that you do to to kind of come on and, and plug this and and talk about kind of what you do. Awesome, awesome. Well, I, I hope everyone has a lovely. Lovely night over there in uh, in in Philadelphia and, and all the whoever else is listening in other places. And, uh, yes. Yeah, we're, we're everywhere. This is the internet. We're everywhere. And uh, if you guys want to see uh, this interview or if you uh, – I'm talking to the audience, uh, I guess – well, I guess the audience is watching. If you want to watch this interview again, uh, it'll probably be up. Uh, the archive will be up in uh, about 24 hours or so. So definitely check it out. 
if you want to uh, see, a, you know, uh, if you missed something, you came in late or whatever. So uh, check it out then. And, uh, Parker, again, thanks, man, for coming on. Killer. Awesome. Thank you so much. Anytime. Have a good one. Bye. Bye. All right. Uh, that was Parker Croft, everyone. We're going to go ahead now. We uh, I want to uh, throw it over to um, our, our good uh, co-host here. I say good, but, you know, I mean, come on. How can you really fuck it up? Uh, Jerry Cavallaro. I want to throw it over to him. He, we've got the contest, our final contest for First Glance Film Month, uh, First Glance Film Philly Month. Uh, and uh, he's going to he's gonna talk about how you guys can win some shit. And we also have the big prize as well that we may, uh, I don't know if we're going to plug. Are we doing that? now or are we doing it at the end of the show how do you want to do the big prize i think we'll do the big prize at the end of the show okay and we'll do another prize right now so that way we can put the person who wins the prize now in the running for the big prize excellent sounds good that sounds like an excellent plan so okay, let's cool. all right so uh jerry uh take it away uh this is this is your your time yeah this is a really lazy contest actually <laughs> i didn't even post anything on the facebook page but i like the facebook contest because we seem to get uh People actually enter, apparently. So I'm going to put the link to our Facebook page, facebook.com slash film snobbery. Go to the page, like it. If you haven't already liked it, leave a comment. First person to leave a comment talking about this show or indie film or anything at all, first person who leaves a comment wins. And you, what you'll win is a one-year subscription to Movie Maker Magazine, courtesy of First Glance Film Festival. That's right. First Glance Film Festivals in both L.A. and Philly. And uh, and also, and uh, Vegas. what was that? And Vegas. And Vegas. I was just going to say that. And Vegas. So, uh, yeah, good stuff. Um, I want to thank everyone who's been uh, tweeting out on our behalf tonight. I want to thank uh, specifically uh, Kristen, Crystal Kenville. I want to thank, uh, obviously, Bill over at First Glance Film, Robert Shutter. I want to thank uh, just uh, so many people that have uh, been supportive. Um, over, we're, you know, we're, uh, uh, it's not real, the real number. We're well over 100 episodes at this point, but uh, I think official Film Snobbery Live episodes that we actually count, we're at uh, 76 episodes. Um, I think it's time to call it quits after that. I don't know. I'm just, I'm just saying. Uh, that's a lot of episodes. How many episodes and we're still only this far along? I know, right? Uh, <laughs> it is. It makes me sad. But, uh, but yeah, so, um, and, and uh, First Glance Film says actually twice a year in Vegas. So, uh, and Social Mapper actually says, I got my first Movie Maker mag, excited, and which is always good that uh, you guys are getting, uh, you're getting your prizes in, uh, courtesy of First Glance here. Um, I got my Movie Maker magazine, just came in too, Joseph Gordon-Levitt on the cover. Um, really happy to see that our, uh, our, our good friends over at Film Courage uh, made the top ten podcasts worth listening to on that, uh, in there. Um, so good for them. And uh, <laughs> Crystal says, no quit and shut it. Uh, yeah, well, you know... We'll see. Um, and uh, first one says, first uh, fest in summer and first ever Vegas Horror Fest next Halloween. Nice. So uh, that'll be good. Hopefully you'll see uh, Film Snobbery there. And, uh, me, you know, I say Film Snobbery like it's someone else. You'll see me there, hopefully. It'd be nice. I haven't been to Vegas since I was a kid. Um, Vegas, baby. Vegas. Um, so, yeah, awesome stuff. So, Jerry, uh, I, I, I'm going to go ahead real quick. I'm going to take a, a quick break. I'm going to play our, uh, an ad from our good friends, The uh, as we I guess they've, they've been dubbed by us and other people, the Netflix of, uh, of independent film, uh, and that's the good Netflix before they went to the dark side, split in half and all that kind of stuff and, and decided to hurt all of our feelings. Uh, the good Netflix, IndiePix Unlimited. Uh, check them out. Get your free trial over at www.indiepixunlimited.com. Uh, they've got great movies. They're adding new titles all the time. Definitely check them out. Uh, when we come back, Jerry's going to tell us who the winner is of our contest, I hope. And then uh, we'll do the big contest after we do our Indiegogo Project of the Week. So see you in a minute.
Boom. That's right. Cash money. We're going to talk about cash money here because we got an Indiegogo project of the week. I don't know if you guys even saw the money come out. I had a little effect thing I set up. I don't know. Whatever. Anyways, hopefully you guys enjoyed that, uh, if you could even see it. But um, we actually do have our Indiegogo project of the month I want to talk about here, and uh, it is our good friends, uh, Tiny, well, good good friends, good movie, Tiny Dancer, brought to you by our good friends at the um, the Independent Collective. That's uh, Jason uh, Tiffany Bartok. Um Great little film uh, they're trying to make. Uh, they're, they're really, we're talking high quality here. Uh, they just got done having a very successful party, little you know, kind of fundraising campaign out in, um, out in Manhattan. They actually are uh, Brooklyn filmmakers. Uh, but why am I telling you all this when actually they can tell you this? Uh, so I'm going to go ahead. I'm going to play the, uh, their pitch video, actually. And when we come back from their pitch video, Jerry is going to announce the... Uh, winner of the Movie Maker subscription, and then we're going to talk a little bit more about Tiny Dancer and what you can do to contribute, and then we'll uh, we'll do the big contest. So stick around, we'll be right back. Hi, I'm Jace. Hi, I'm Tiffany. We're filmmakers and we live in Brooklyn, New York. And yes, this is another fundraiser. Absolutely, yet yeah. another one. You didn't think you were going to get one, but you get one. Uh, we are making a film about a legendary principal dancer who is driven to dance again after the birth of her baby. It's called Tiny Dancer. The film stars Katherine Crockett, and she is the principal dancer at uh, Martha Graham, so you may know of her. Um, she's playing Lauren Drake, and it also stars Daphne Rubin Vega, who you may know from Jack Goes Boating or Me Rent. and Rent. Yes. Um, they're like from just being generally awesome. Uh, she plays Sheila. This film is about the choices a woman makes in her adult life. For a lot of people, it's expected that you're going to feel completely whole and perfect after you give birth to your child and you become a mother, but for a lot of people that doesn't happen. Um, for a lot of people they continue to search and yearn for something bigger. Can you be an artist and can you be a parent? I, I think that's something that has only gotten deeper in our lives since we've had our son. No, don't bite me. Don't bite me. <laughs> our goal uh, for this campaign is to try to raise $10,000 to shoot for three more days and we hope that you guys will donate and contribute to our fundraising campaign so we can finish this film because it means so much to us thanks one dollar two dollars okay three thousand dollars <laughs> don't forget it's free and totally awesome when you tweet facebook tumble uh youtube tumble <laughs> Vimeo, anything. Share any element of this project and this campaign, please, by all means. Fruit Loop. A lot of people are fruit looping. <laughs> I want it all. Yeah, I can be the best mom, and I can be the best dancer. Mm, mommy needs you. Thank you, mommy. Mommy needs you. Lauren Drake is the most amazing dancer in the whole planet. Well, we were kindred spirits. Um, I'll always love Lauren. I think sometimes the better thing to do when you're fighting so hard for something is to let it go. I want to dance again. In the right company. Okay. This is my identity. This isn't. Do you know how people would die to have your life? I was the best. You...
you got to support a movie where your lead actress wears hammer pants. That being said, we're going to talk a little bit more about Tiny Dancer in a second, but I want to go uh, give the reins back to our uh, co-host here, Jerry Cavallero, and talk about who the big winner is for the big winner for the little prize that we have tonight. Yes, the big winner for the little prize. Uh, Charles Simmons, uh, Metronome Picks to you in the chat room. Uh, he beat Kristen, Crystal Kenville by like 20 seconds with his comment. Uh, uh, congratulations, Charles, and uh, better luck next time, Crystal. Sorry. Thanks, man. Now i got to go see her on Sunday, and I have to deal with that. I have to live with yeah. that now. Thank you. <laughs> um, I need to be fair with the contest. If I start playing favorites, then I'm going to be accused by, like, the six people that watch this show, and they'll be upset with us. That, that is yeah. true. The, you know, we can't play favorites like I do with you every week. You don't, know how to, you don't even know how to pr do, go with that, do you? <laughs> um, no, that's the only reason I'm still the co-host. <laughs> well, uh, do me a favor there, uh, metronome picks in the chat room. Go ahead and email me. Um, let's see. First one says, hey, Nick, how many non-winners are on the chat right now? That, that that's a loaded question, sir. Um, <laughs> several uh, metronome picks. Do me a favor. Go ahead, email me nick at filmsnobbery dot com. That's n i c at filmsnobbery dot com, and uh, get me your your, uh, your you know name, address, phone number, typical contact details. We'll get you set up for your one year movie maker magazine subscription. So there, um, Crystal Kendall unfriended Jerry, and it's way more than six, or it will be. <laughs> Funny. Um, Let's see here. Uh, how many people do we have in the chat room uh, currently that don't have Movie Maker subscriptions? Uh, I don't know because I don't know who all the people that are that don't have them are. Um, Crystal doesn't have one. Red Locker, I don't know. I don't know. He missed winning he won, last week. Didn't he win? I thought Red Locker missed it or last he week. Just missed it. Yeah, he said Red Locker. I don't have a sub because he's been here every week, and I have to yeah, and give him credit. Seen. And he keeps missing it by like a second, so I, I feel really bad for him. But Red Locker doesn't have one, um, and uh, so uh, Crystal doesn't have one. Red Locker doesn't have one. Social Mapper does. Metronome now does. First glance, well, fuck him. He has a. He said, "Give everyone a movie maker sub." Okay, so I guess I guess what's up Red here Locker, is... Red you get a Movie Maker sub. Yeah. And yeah. Chris Conville, you get a Movie Maker sub. And you get a Movie Maker sub. So, yeah. so, so what happened is that uh, uh, Bill Ostroff, the festival director for the First Glance Film Festival, decided to go Oprah on everyone um, and uh, give everyone a subscription. So uh, everyone uh, that's there, uh, go ahead. Please email me your contact details, name, address, phone number over at Nick, N-I-C, at filmsnobbery.com, and I will go ahead and uh, pass that info on to Bill. And, Let, uh, we'll let's just clarify one thing, though. If you're watching this in an archive, you're not getting the subscription. You have to have been watching the show right now and be in our chat room right now. Oh, snap. Good good yeah. call. Good call, Mr. Then you're Jerry. Get, like dozens of emails of people that are watching it or like people that are like, "Oh, look, in the archive, pretend you watched it." That is true. Only live participants. And and that it's funny you said that because you know, I will say if even if we don't get the best participation here um uh, you know, we we love the audience we do get, but even though we don't get huge numbers on the live shows, it's really funny. Like even Jerry's uh Jerry's interview when we did the the Jerry exclusive, um he's gotten several hundred extra views on his particular episode and and it's uh you know I've been very very happy with the response that people have gotten for that. So uh yeah, so that being said, Everyone, send me your, uh, everyone who's here in the chat room now, send me your info. We'll get you hooked up with your motherfucking movie make a subscription. And it'll yeah, be awesome. And Crystal, you better refriend me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Film Snobbery on Twitter is hug. Yeah, well, that's, or huge. Oh, okay, there we go. Um, uh, Film Snobbery is not just huge in, on Twitter. We're huge in Japan and in my pants. Um, so that, <laughs> that said, um, uh, email again hey, is, email again. Uh, here, I'll just type it in the chat room, nick at filmsnobbery.com. There. Um, that said, uh, one of the reasons why I want to go ahead and uh, get that out of the way is because I did want to talk a little bit more about uh, Tiny Dancer here uh, as our Indiegogo project of the week. Um, thank you for John Hoff for pr pr uh, putting the... Um, the uh, the link for the project in the chat room up above there if you want to put it in again so it's a little bit more uh, 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 thing. Um, 
<laughs> Chris says, I want a film snobbery t-shirt. Yeah, I want to get them made, too. Uh, but anyways, that's a whole other discussion. That said, um, Tiny Dancer, cool stuff. One of the reasons why I really wanted to, to highlight this project is because, uh, A, it looks like a cool project. It really does. I, I love this, you know, what they're doing cinematography-wise and, and the casting, the acting looks really good. Uh, plus, uh, having had an opportunity to talk with Jason, Tiffany, Bartok, uh, uh, be, who are behind this project, and the Independent Collective as well. Uh, you can go check them out, theindependentcollective.com. Um, they're taking a slightly different route to film financing and, and not only their own movie, but they want to start financing other movies as well, which is something that is really close to my heart because that is going to be a large focus on what I do with Film Snobbery next year is we're going to start um, financing films. I, I'm saying that fucking publicly right now. We are going to get into the business of making movies. Uh, not making movies like where I'm directing and producing anything, but we want to help get movies made. Um, that is is going to be what, uh, you know, when we do our screening series, when we do fundraisers, when we do stuff, the primary goal is to going to be to, to make money, to put money towards other projects. And that is our, that is going to be uh, what's going to take up the, the bulk of my next year. Um, that and one other project that I can't talk about yet. Uh, but um, once I do have more details on it, you guys will be the first to know, because that's how I roll. People who watch get the deets. Um, yes, so, yeah, Jerry says it right here in the chat room. Help us help you. So, but that said, yeah, the independentcollective.com, one of the things that they're doing is is they're making uh, film financing for, for filmmakers, not only through uh, platforms like Indiegogo, Kickstarter, and stuff like that, um, but through their own, um, you know, fundraising efforts, uh, whether it be through um, invitational parties or stuff like that, you know, um, they're making stuff like that possible for other people, and, and it's something that is really kind of funny. And we ended up talking to them because we got some information about that and, and how, you know, we really thought that that was a uh, very synergetic type of thing to what we were doing. So I wanted to kind of talk to them about that and, and see how they, they've been faring and stuff like that and, and making their movie and making their stuff come true. And hopefully, you know, we, we make other people's dreams come true uh, going forward and, and helping people like uh, Tiffany and Jace and their little maniac, as they call them, that little kid you saw in the, the, the pitch video who was, uh, uh, well, we were, Jerry and I were actually talking to them um, earlier last week. He was in the background, and it was quite funny. Um, but... Uh, He's cute. He, sound, he sounds like a very cute child. Uh, so, uh, yeah, go check out the independentcollective.com, see what they're working on. Um, we're going to be moving into very similar territory in the future, and, uh, yeah, that's why, one of the reasons why I want to talk about it. Not only is it a worthwhile project, and, again, I say uh, if you can't donate time, please donate. Uh, I mean, if you can't donate money, donate time. Uh, give them a tweet. Give them a Google Plus One or whatever, and give them a Facebook like or, or share it on your Facebook wall or timeline or whatever the fuck they're calling it now. And uh, get the word out there because, um, you know, the whole idea here is that I, I don't even want to sit there and say, hey, oh, it's the community. There's no fucking community. But there are individual projects, and, and uh, you know, every project needs a champion, and, and we try to be a champion to as many projects as possible. Um, there is an idea of a community out there, but, you know, at the end of the day, Everyone is kind of out for their own project and to you know want, make their own dreams succeed, get to that next tier where they don't have to beg for money and all that kind of stuff. And hopefully we get to a point where we can help make that a reality for a lot of people. Um, so, yeah, that's... Uh that's it. I, I know I just kind of went into a whole thing there, but um, and there's plenty more where that came from. Um, maybe someday I'll have a show where I get to talk more uh, openly and honestly about s stuff like that. Uh, but uh, you never know. We'll see what happens. Um, it's not going to be this show, though. This show's a completely different animal. Um, but, Jerry, let's get me back on track to something else that is a little bit more uh, appropriate for what we, uh, we're doing here. Let's talk about the big prize and what we're going to be doing to, to make some, get some people winning uh, for this new prize for uh, First Glance, for the end of our First Glance Film Festival month that we do. Uh, it seems like we do uh, every, well, twice a year we do it because <laughs> they have two festivals a year. Uh, so what do, we, what do we got going on here? I have no idea. I thought you were going to cover that. Okay. All right, then. Uh, I know it's awesome software that's worth $300 and that it's going to someone who's won our contest in the past uh, but, yeah, we, got to, uh, we haven't exactly figured that part out, Nick. 
You're absolutely right. But yes, uh, support, you know, hashtag, First Men's Film says hashtag support indie film, use it, love it, tweet it, I agree. Um, Social Mapper, no shit community, no shit community, so true. I, uh, or I assume that no shit, it was bleeped, I don't know, it could be no fucking community, it could be whatever. Um, I, you know, and then uh, Nick and I talk about that all the time, almost done with my second CF, it's a, t uh, crowdfunding, it's a tough one. Met Metro and Pixie, yeah, no, I, I definitely, I hear you. Crowdfunding is, is tough, because it's, it, it, but you can learn from failure just as much as you can learn from success. Um, it's one of the reasons why I actually support Indiegogo so much. Uh, people always ask me, you know, Kickstarter has such a uh, lo much larger fan base um, and, and whatnot. You guys should get in bed with them and blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, no. I like Indiegogo because sometimes people fail. And with Indiegogo, even if you fail, at least you're not a complete failure. You walk away with what you were able to scrounge, and to me, that is a success. And also, their analytics are are pretty well good. You know, they're pretty good. You get to see where your audience came from. You get to see who the people who are sharing your stuff are. You get to see who's donating. You get to see who's just you know tweeting about it. Who's you know who's referring people. Who's doing this that. I really like what, how they set that back end up. Um, I really enjoy. Uh, I, I just enjoy the the way the site is put together. I like the payment options. Um, but that being said, it is. Um, uh, uh, Crystal says Indiegogo is amazing, is really underutilized. Oh, I, I completely agree. They can't market their way out of a fucking paper bag. And, and, and I don't think that's uh, necessarily a... F uh, I can't blame any one person over it there on their staff on that. Um, I you blame know. them all. <laughs> so we'll blame them all. No, it, you know what it is. I don't. I, I don't know if it's whether Kickstarter just has a larger um, head start in front of them or whatever. But you know what? I go to festivals. I see Indiegogo there. I promote Indiegogo at festivals. They 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 always throw great parties. They're always very not great. They're good to filmmakers and good to artists in general in the community. It's one of the reasons why I support them. Um, there are many other reasons why I support them as well. Uh, some of them I made public. Some of them I haven't. Um, they don't really throw a lot of money at us. I mean, I I have to go and I literally have to beg and. Say hey, you know, we, um, you know, we got this thing we want to do. We want to help promote you. Can you throw us a shekel or two? And they, they, uh, they do agree most. Of, you know, I should say most of the time they've agreed like twice. So I can't really say that. You know, I mean, uh, they're a great sponsor to, to work with. They're great people to work with. Um, but you know, they're a business just like any other. So you know, they have to see the value in what you do. Um, lately, they have been, and that's a good thing to hear. I don't know why I'm going with any of that. Barely what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to avoid, I'm avoiding having to talk about this new prize because I don't know what the hell I'm doing for a contest. Um, but uh, hold on a second. Um, uh, Nick is also undervalued. I completely agree because right now um, I'm undervalued under zero. I think I need to be valued at at least $100, if not more. Uh, but that said, um, let's go ahead and let's talk about this prize. Now, one of the qualifications we've had for uh, this prize um, going forward uh, for the big prize, which, Jerry, why don't you go ahead? Let's talk about the big prize. Let's, ha let's have you talk about it real quick. No, I still don't even know what it is. I just know it's $300 software. It's all right. Well, if, from what I understand, it's Gorilla Pro software. Um, for those of you guys who don't know what Gorilla Pro is, it's actually really cool pre-production scheduling software. Also, um, they've got a great little feature that actually even lets you schedule uh, and manage your film festival submissions as well. Um, it has a complete festival submission list and the whole nine yards. It's kind of like a. Uh, it, there's a part of it that's even. Um, it, it's kind of like a, without a box, but on your computer rather than up in the cloud. Uh, with you know, or in the you know, where without a box is on the internet, um, they've got some really cool stuff, um, and uh, one of the the. Um one of the prerequisites we've had is that you had to have watched the entire month of First Glance shows uh, to qualify. Now, obviously, um, Metronome Picks, uh, you, and you had to win a prize previous to that as well. Uh, you had to be a previous winner uh, at one of these shows. Now, Metronome Picks just won, so that does make him uh, eligible. Um, Yes, yeah, go to uh, uh, Jungle Software slash Home. Um, they, they really do have some really cool stuff. Uh, as I mean, that, it's really good software. I mean, there's like three types of software out there that I really believe strongly in. Jungle Software is one of them. Uh, the other is Sony Vegas. Um, you know, not only because they're a sponsor of ours, but because, I mean, it's how I learned how to edit poorly. 
Um, but I learned how to edit. And uh, the other one is uh, the Showbiz Software uh, packages both budgeting and scheduling. They, they've just got really good things. Now, that being said, um, Devin Watson has some uh, cool software that he's been working on for pre-producing. I, I think it's actually called Pre-Producer. Uh, that is absolutely the shit. And when that thing finally goes into open beta, you guys are going to be blown the fuck away because I've been using that software for uh, in alpha testing for a while now, and I've loved it. Uh, that said, Jungle Software, Gorilla Pro, uh, great, great software. Um, for, uh, let's see, Bill says, why don't we ask about the names and films of all the first glance guests? Names and films of all the first glance guests. Um, Do you know that info offhand, Nick? <laughs> no. Uh, I follow as many people as I possibly can, and I try to stay abreast, but the, let's be honest, folks. I mean, there's thousands of movies that are going on out there yeah, now. and it's... I think he, he means the guests that have been on our show the last three weeks. Oh, you mean kind of yeah, like a, like, uh, kind of like, what, like a, a contest almost or something? Yeah. Well, like, no, like as part of the contest, like the... Right now that can answer that question and has won in the past will win. Okay, so, so... What we're saying here is that now I have to actually remember the last four shows I've done. Yes, that's what we're saying. Fuck. Okay. See, this is why I said we should have gone over this before the show. Probably. All right. So hold on. Hold on. We just and had. Like, yeah, because this is a little bit outside of my wheelhouse. Like... <laughs> hold, hold on a second. Wait, wait, wait a second. I think I got some. I got some info. All right. So we had, we had, uh, uh, we just had Parker Croft on. Okay. We yeah, had. Don't we'll... give the guests the answers. Well, no. Sure. I'm trying to. I, I, okay, don't t ch check your archives. Don't tell them. Okay, um, first to post that. Oh, okay. I got you. I got you. I got you. We say so. Go ahead and post uh, on on our Facebook wall uh, the list of all of the guests that we've had for the for First Glance Film Festival month. And I'll give you a clue. I think it starts at episode seventy two, three, four, five, six. Yeah, so that should be about it. So I think it starts at episode 72 if you're watching how we number them. So if uh, the first person to go ahead and and, uh, and and post to our Facebook wall. And here's the, the, the clincher. You have to like our, our Facebook page, which I think you have to do anyway to post on the I wall. Think everyone, I think everyone in the chat room has already liked our page. Or if you, have, if you want to post something, you have to, I think, anyway. Great. So you have to post the names in films, and the first to do it gets the prize. So... Go. <laughs> um, and while while I'm, we're waiting for you guys to get that done, I'm going to talk a little bit more about First Glance Film Festival. You know why I continue to work with Bill and his festivals, and why I I'm always excited to uh, you know to, to to start a new season of uh, First Glance Film Festival coverage. Um, First and foremost, Bill picks great movies. I mean, this is a nice running joke where Bill kind of yells at me on every friggin' show when I I talk about how oh we you know we've uh, you know oh I've screened this movie that I got from them or you know oh I would screen uh, you know Parker's movie I would I would screen Falling Overnight at my at my uh, my screen series with the drop of a hat and he always yells at me like stop poaching my movies. The reason why I do is because he picks good fucking movies. The fact of the matter is, is that I see festival uh, I've seen movies from his festival at festivals all over the country. Um, every time I go to a, a festival, there's always a movie that he has screened beforehand uh, playing there. And, and it's because he really, I think, Bill has a great nose and eye for and mouth on for good movies. I don't know. Uh, Bill has a good, he really has a good eye for good independent films. And I think he has his, his finger on the pulse of what audiences want to see. He's, he's one of those festival directors that I think programs um, you know, obviously films that, you know, for filmmakers that he wants to, to, to really push and promote, but also I think he's really good at promoting and pushing films for an audience uh, and programming for an audience, and uh, which is something really important uh, because at the end of the day, it's the audience that's paying to see these. I think that's why uh, Bill always has a, such a dedicated audience on both coasts, which is something that, you know, he's one of the few film festival directors that has uh, festival on on both sides of the continent and uh, and, and does a really good job at, at, at maintaining both of them and has for you know f I think it's like 13 or 14 and 15 years uh, a piece on each side so I mean guy's got almost 30 years of film festival experience just with his own fests uh, when you combine them plus you know starting new festivals out in, in Las Vegas and offering new theatrical opportunities for a film festival uh, um, or for his film festival winners but also other filmmakers um, 
He offers great uh, distribution opportunities on not only his own website, First Glance Films for Shorts, but also working in conjunction with other uh, sites like IndiePix Unlimited uh, to get films distributed through there and through other networks as well. Um, he just, uh, he did, yeah, see, 14 years, so he says, um, uh, let's see... Uh, <laughs> yeah, the first one's film. We don't pick them, they enter them. After watching 15,000 indie films, I should know. Yeah, and that, that says... Um you know, first glance, Bill Bill has been doing this long enough where I think he does definitely knows what what to look for in a film, and and him and I talk about you know things like the film community. We talk about these different platforms that are out there all the time. We talk about um, we talk about a lot of things, and one of the things I'll I'll definitely say about about Bill, uh, and I, I can say this with all honesty, he's, he's no bullshit. Um, you know, he's he's the real deal with Bill McNeil, as they say. Uh, that was a news radio joke for you guys uh, going going back uh, many many years. I'm old. Um, but, uh, yeah, he's, he's, uh, Bill is, Bill's a cool dude, and, and he knows what's what, and, uh, that's why we continue working with him, because I work with people who don't give me bullshit, and, and I work with people who are straight up and honest about what they want and what they need and, and what they need to do to get to where they want to be, and, um, you know, he, he's a, a great asset for, and, and, you know, he talks about me being undervalued, undervalued, he's an under, uh, been undervalued in terms of a, a film festival director, and, uh, I highly recommend that if anyone wants to submit to his festivals, um, on either coast that they do it, uh, I would say do it fucking blindly, um, and uh, and then submit again just to give him more money, give him more money, because uh, he's worth it. He flat out, it's fucking worth it. He doesn't always have you know the biggest festivals and all this and he doesn't, he's not paying the way for every fucking filmmaker that gets there. But the fact is, is that his festivals, his screenings are attended. Um, the fest, the filmmakers. Are, are looked after and they are felt like they, they you know, they're there to, you know, their movie is being supported and, um, you know, the, the guy keeps his overhead low. I mean, it's basically him and like maybe one or two other people at any given time at any given festival and, uh, you know, he doesn't have these huge boards of directors that he's paying, you know, thousands of dollars in salaries to and stuff like that. The man barely, you know, the man barely makes out on his own festival, I'm sure. I don't know. But, you know, the fact is, is that, you know, he knows how to get it done and he knows how to do, get it done on a budget and uh, he knows how to do it with good movies and how to attract an audience. So if you want to continue seeing festivals like this, uh, go throw your movie at him. That's just how it, how it works. Um, let's see. Uh, <laughs> um, oh, look at that. And, and <laughs> Jerry, uh, uh, let's see. Um, next year we'll only have uh, we'll be the only mid-sized film festival that will offer feature and short theatrical distribution. See, there you go. Bill, see, Bill's always on the cutting edge, and that's not even considering there's there's some new platforms that are coming out. They're going to take care of a lot of the problems that um, that uh, have been plaguing filmmakers lately. Because look, I've been the first person to say it, and I have said it in writing when I do, you know, writing for like MasteringFilm.com and even for my own site. I don't give a fuck about all the platforms. I don't care that you're on Netflix. I don't care that you're on iTunes. I don't care if you're here, there, there, whatever. The pla the fact is, you could be everywhere. If you're not driving traffic to those things, if you're not bringing your audience, if you're not building an audience, and if you're not showing them where to where your shit is, it, none of where it could be everywhere. It doesn't matter. It, it, at this point, you're competing with the world for attention, and and um, you need to you need to bring it. You do as a filmmaker need to bring it. Um, and and film festivals are still relevant because. They offer you a free venue, relatively free venue, basically for the cost of admission or the cost of winning a contest to get in uh, to the festival, to play at the festival. But they basically give you a free venue and they're bringing you an audience. Now, can you do more to bring more of an audience to these things? Absolutely. But this is why film festivals are still valuable to filmmakers. They offer you a theatrical screening opportunity. And not all of them are above, but not every festival is above board and, and worth it, but, you know, festivals like, like First Glance and festivals like Sidewalk and New Hampshire and, you know, stuff like that, th those are all worth it um, and, and uh, you know, worth the price of admission and, and worth, uh, you know, worth it. I mean, it's just, it, it is what it is. So there we go. Um, Orlando. Like I said. Um, not that Orlando, That's right? You gotta <laughs> throw that in there. That is true. We are going to Orlando, and it'll be uh, fun times. We had a good time there last year. It'll be good. I'm looking forward to having another very long car ride with Jerry. Yeah, I'm not looking forward to the road trip down, especially when last year we were like, okay, we're go if we go back next year, we're definitely not driving again. It would be better, Jerry, if you could drive, because then we could switch off. You know, but because you can't drive, and I'm not saying he can't, like he's physically unable, he doesn't have a license, it is what it is. Also, 
I've, if you've ever had a conversation with Jerry in a room, you'll see how animated he is and how he paces and all that kind of stuff. Take that and put that in a car. And that is where I think Jerry would have a hard time as a driver because I think he's, I mean, in terms of ADD, I think he really actually has it. Um, so there. Yeah. Um, I'll be like driving down the street and be like, oh, look, a billboard. And then I'll just discuss the trailer of whatever movie was being promoted on the billboard. And by the way, Crystal Kendall says, there are too many filmmakers out there and you have to stand out, work it, everything you do is important. Film festivals, you, your fans, every piece of publicity, get off your ass, I assume it's get off your ass and do it. Um, God, I suck at typing and I am a writer, why do I get paid? I don't know. All I know is that they do pay you and that paycheck is a sweet, Wait, sweet thing. Uh, writers, but, writers can get paid? Writers can totally get paid. What the hell? I get paid to write. I'm not getting paid. I get paid to write. I don't know what the fuck you're doing wrong. Uh, do we have a winner yet? Do you have any of ideas of what I'm doing wrong? Do we have a winner yet or do I have to stall for longer? We have to stall for longer. You guys are no fucking killing me. Surprise. Huh? No one wants this prize, apparently. Okay, guys. So, again, prize, you're getting $300 worth of fucking software here. All you got to do is go back in our archives that we've already posted in the chat room. And all you got to do is go ahead and pick out the last uh, four. Uh, that's the number. The last four names of the four uh, filmmakers or the you know, four guests that we've had on and the names of their movies that, they're pro that they were on promoting. And you get the prize. That's how it works. Uh, so, yes. Uh, yeah. So, I'll stall for a little bit longer. Uh, so, yeah, that, that was my whole, my whole kind of rant about why uh, First Glance Film Festivals is the shit, why we continue to work with them. Um, but, uh, yeah, I mean, there's uh, festivals in general, I think, are still probably one of the only places that filmmakers are going to get a, a, the, uh, let's call it the illusion of a traditional theatrical distribution agreement. And let's be honest, folks, for the most part, with the exception of um, film festivals, traditional theatrical is bullshit. It's a losing game for, for everybody. It really is. Um, working in the screening series, or if you are going to pay for it yourself and you have plans to do something, uh, you know, but you're not looking for that, you know, that distribution agreement, you're not looking for to make money on it, you just want to get it seen, that's one thing. But if you think you're going to make money on theatrical, you're out of your fucking mind. Especially if you're, I mean, if you're not, if you're minimizing your investment into it, and just like someone's saying, like, here, show it here for free, do your thing, we'll give you a week or two week run or whatever, no one's going to make money, any money on a one-off. You know, even, even you know, especially you look at something like the, the Quad out in, in uh, New York, I can't imagine someone paying that kind of money, and then also with the P&A expense on that, and expecting to make any money back on it. Uh, you can fill the fucking thing every night, and you're not going to make your money back. You're just, you're not going to. It's just, it is what it is. So, um, yeah. I don't know why so many still chase after theatrical distribution, and there's really no reason for it. It's an ego boost. Yeah, it really is. In I think a lot of what drives filmmakers in the industry is about ego, anyway. Um, and and you know, part of what producers looking to make movies like I, I still hear that where it's like, well, this is a great film, and I can see this selling great on DVD. This is like a cult movie, but how do you expect to make a lot of money theatrical? I'm like, I don't. I expect it to go straight to DVD. Now, well, real quick here. Like, it has to be theatrical. Wait a second. This is important. Red Locker says Kevin Smith made big bucks with Red State Theatrical, didn't he? Yes, he did, but he also charged $150 a ticket. And, and he really, it was because it's Kevin fucking Smith, and he was doing a Q&A with his theatrical. Yes. And, you know, they, people were paying for Kevin Smith. They weren't paying for the movie. Yeah. Um, and and, and uh, someone else, is Kevin Smith still indie? No, he isn't. Um... In, a, in some ways he is, but I, I don't think he has been indie really since Clerks. Um, and even I think he'll admit that. I think that he's he has had, I think Red State is is the most indie he's been. But at the end of the day, uh, you know, Kevin Smith is an aberration in what we talk about as, as indie film because of, you know, his career and stuff he's like that. He's, he's, no, uh, he, he, 
Uh, yeah, exactly. Yeah, I, I'll agree with that. I mean, he's been able to maintain indie cred because of the types of movies he's made, as well as his interaction and his presence with his fans. And, and you know, there's a big difference between how he interacts with people and the way Steven Spielberg does. And I think that that's why he's still considered indie by many people. And honestly, I hold Kevin Smith up as the example to filmmakers nowadays that if you want to have a movie that is theatrically successful or you want to have the audacity to charge $150 for a screening per ticket to, uh, you know, if you're going to include a Q&A and you're going to pack that fucking house and stuff like that, you have to be like Kevin Smith. I'm not saying people can be Kevin Smith. I'm saying you got to be like that. You have to be engaged with your audience constantly. You have to nurture it over time. Don't just expect it to be there. You have to go where they are and you have to give them what they want. Um, I just I just did a, an article on uh, MasteringFilm.com about how uh, everything, it was called, I think, entitled, Everything I Learned About Indie Film Marketing I Learned From Porn. Uh, look at porn stars on Twitter, Facebook, stuff like that, on their own websites even. They are masters at, lear at learning how to, and showing people how to uh, get, uh, get money out of people. And, and, and let's be honest, folks, porn on the internet is free. It, it is what it is, but there are still people that are able to, to, there are still these stars and starlets that are able to get people to shell out hard-earned money for, whether it's for those, you know, for a free cam show, or whether it's for, you know, a subscription to even their site. I mean, most of those sites are pay sites. Um, why would I do that when I can go over to another website and see all that stuff for free? It's because they want to support that person. Um, it has to do with the person, not the product. Porn is everywhere. It is, it's as mainstream as it comes. And the fact of the matter is, is that, you know, people still are willing to support and pay, plunk down hard-earned money for, you know, to watch these girls or guys or whoever do what they do. And, and it's because they want to support that particular starlet. You know, they, they, that's who they're into. And that's the, the idea. You've got to make them into you in that way, where they want to support you. They want to plunk down their hard-earned money for you and what you have to do. It also means don't give it away for free. They, I mean, I say that with having Jerry on the line here, but when I say don't give it away for free, what I mean is they know how to entice people with the freebies and then get you to pay for more. And that's what it's that's all what about. I'm that's what, sort of what I'm doing with, uh, with Stuck by Chuck, because if you want to see the bonus features and everything, make a donation. Yeah. So I'm taking a, I, I took a page out of the porn handbook. Um, I like uh, Red Locker said uh, Sasha Gray was doing the, uh, the damn thing when it came to talking Okay, this talking to fans. Yeah, well, yeah it's talking still no longer important. Yeah, I get it. Yeah. Yep. Um, and uh, Ron Jeremy, not sure, seems like more uh, more like Bruce Campbell of porn, where he's like a praised relic of an old time. Yeah, but you know what, though? I mean, you'll still go see him at, you know, if he's at a, a Comic-Con or, or if he's at some kind of thing, you'll still see him. I and mean, he's been in other movies. I mean, he was in Orgasmo. He was he in... Uh, a lot of horror. He does too. a lot of horror flicks. Yeah, he was it's at, funny. I actually uh, emailed him once because I wanted to do a interview with him when he was coming to New York. And I think he didn't understand. Like, it was for a part of a documentary that I never actually made. But uh, when I was, like, reaching out to people, and he said he'd come and do the interview for $1,000 and if I paid for his hotel room. And I was like, I don't think he's understanding. This isn't a, a gig. This is... And he just kept coming back to me with, like, figures. And I'm like, no, I'm not hiring you for a shoot. So I, I just thought that was kind of funny that you brought up Ron Jeremy. Right. Uh, but that said, uh, you know, Bill says the difference with porn is that the stars are contracted with studios like old-time Hollywood. Yes and no. I mean, there are a lot of independents that work out there. And the idea, though, is that a lot of them, this is what the, how they make the living. I mean, just like how I make a living working with film snobbery and doing what I do here. Um, you know, that's it, the example of using porn or even Kevin Smith to an extent because of how he interacts with his fans and how he sells himself and his, the image of himself as well as selling his movies and selling merchandise and, and even extending that reach out to his friends and family and all that kind of stuff to get their careers jump-started. That's exactly. I mean, you want to, when you want to talk about a community, you really do have to look at the Sir Network and, and you know the Smallcast Internet Radio Network and all that kind of stuff. Because here's a guy who basically took his career and then took his friends, his family, his uh, network of influence, and he extended it out and you know his audience and said, you know, now go watch their stuff and tell me what you you know listen to their stuff and tell me how you like it and you know because these guys are funny fucks too and we want to we want to get their stuff out there. And you know what? That is, I think, a lot of what. Um, Indie film need indie film needs you need 
high, more highly visible people out there in our world that that are like, you know what? No, that those are cool people over there. Go go work with them and go look at what they're doing. And that's how you expand an audience like that. Not by passing the fucking buck around, the same buck around to every goddamn director who's putting up an Indiegogo project or a Kickstarter project. That's to me is not support. That is uh, glad handing, and that's that's you know everyone uh, you know uh, clapping for themselves because now we're good people because we we retweeted you. That's not what. That's not what a community is, and that's not how people uh, get ahead in the industry. Um, having that social network, having that social reach is great, but you tell you put a dollar am, uh, amount on that right now. I got 10,000 followers on Twitter, and you want me to tell you? I can put a dollar amount to that 10,000 followers, and it ain't 10,000. <laughs> um, it is what it is. Anyway, I've gone on way too long, and I know it sounds cynical and shitty, but that's the industry. The industry is a, it's a business, and you have to look at everything with... This is how my, my time and effort is worth. How much is it worth? And there's a dollar amount attached to that. It's just like any other job. You make you know, minimum wage, you make whatever it is an hour. That's how you work with independent film as well as you know, what is your time worth. Um, but anyway, I know I've, gone, I've diverged on a million different things. But I've been told we have a winner. And I want Jerry to talk yeah. about that winner. And I just thought it was kind of funny because Metronome Picks just posted in the chat room. I love that this show goes unscripted. You get better conversations. Conversations I'd have with my own crew and team, and that's so, the point of this and, show. It really yeah. always has been. And the reason it's so funny that he posted that, I completely agree with that, because he's also the winner. Yay! So, yeah, uh, he posted uh, Ali Sher with Maiden and the Princess, mm. Sean Hackett Homecoming, uh, Wonder Russell with uh, Summer Home, mm -hmm. and then he went a little bit further with Brian Koppelman, Past Projects and Remakes, and me with Get Stuck. <laughs> there you yeah. go. So look at he went he went far back. So awesome and and obviously I mean we'll give you a pass for I don't know if you put Parker Croft and no and, but yeah we did say your the past guest we didn't mention tonight's guest so okay uh, I figured we can give him a pass on that. Also he's the only person that actually attempted it. Yeah, there you go and he he did the whole of September basically so there you go. So yay. yay! So you uh, you won. Uh, uh, it's three worth three hundred dollars. It's it's Jungle Software. It's Gorilla Pro. Uh, it's 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 a really good software. Bill will hook you up with it. Um, uh, you can go ahead actually, and uh, when you email me for your. Um, <laughs> I'd have done it faster, but my little girl was crying. No excuses. Um, <laughs> Um, at first glance, Wonder and, was uh, Connect Wonder 2. Russell was for Connect 2. Well, it was Connect 2, but she was also promoting the Summer Home, which she co-wrote or wrote, and that was be it was in their screenwriting contest, I think, or oh, right. something like that. I don't know. I don't, know. I don't actually watch the show. Yeah, me neither. I, 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 I'm doing the show. I could, I've got, I'm surprised I can form a cogent thought during the show with all the shit that I'm looking at constantly. Um, and I'm like checking my notes and all this, this other stuff. It's mostly stuff. porn that Bill sent you. It really is, because <laughs> Bill sends me the best porn. Um, he really does. No, kidding. He doesn't send me porn. I wish he would. Anyway, that said, uh, we, uh, th so we have a winner, um, you know, Gorilla Pro Software, uh, courtesy of First Glance Film Festivals and our good friend, uh, festival director Bill Ostroff. Uh, when you email me, uh, I guess all your details for your Movie Maker subscription, um, I guess we'll go ahead and we'll get that out to you as well. Uh, so there you go. So, um, that's yeah. a long fucking show, so I think we're done. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. So, uh, hopefully, we see all you guys next. Uh, we're not going to be doing a show next week, and probably not the week after either. That after uh, all of the traveling and everything, I'm going to be wiped. But uh, let's go ahead and uh, let's let's um, let's let's promote. Yeah, I just realized probably not the week after that either. Why? So maybe, maybe we'll come back. Well, because we're finally going to get home at like Wednesday, and from being on the road, you'll be on the road for two weeks. Well, right. right? That's why I said not so, next week. But, not next week, well, and not the week after. Yeah, but that's next week isn't uh, anything. Yeah, Our, dude, like, next week I'm going to be gone next, at first glance. No, but I'm saying next week's going to be first glance. Yeah. The week after that will be Orlando. Right. And the week after that, we're going to be getting home the Wednesday. You, are you going to be up for a show the next day? 
that we can come back right after you've been gone for two weeks? I mean, we'll like, definitely have shit to talk about. I mean, because we'll have gone okay. to, I'll, I'll have gone to three festivals by then. Okay, I, no, I'm good for it. I but just, let's I, put it this I, way, folks. I, I, Watch our Twitter over at twitter.com slash film snobbery and keep up to date with whether or not we'll have a show then. And you can also, uh, we'll let you know uh, over on our Facebook page over at facebook.com slash film snobbery, which most of you have been at tonight, which is awesome. Uh, you For all, all the, the stuff that we put out every day, including our columns and including, uh, you know, reviews, news, the whole nine yards, go over to filmsnobbery.com. Uh, we will actually be revising and re redoing filmsnobbery.com uh, almost from the ground up uh, in the very near future to reflect a lot of the stuff that we got coming up. Uh, so if you see the, cha the page either not loading or loading weird or different or whatever or not quite complete, it's because I'm working on the back end on it. Um, <laughs> I've, I've, I could either redo, you know, the 600, 700 posts that we have on the site or, uh, you know, for separately and then re-upload everything or I could just work on it live. Screw it. Why not, right? Um, yes. Um, Let's see. Uh, and I, uh, Christmas and I said I wasn't going to be up this late. See, no one can get enough of me. This is how it is. No, I'm kidding. Uh, I wish. Uh, but but that said, we've got a we've you know we're gonna, we've got some great stuff coming up in the the, the future future. Um, you know, again, we'll be uh, we're going to be all over the map. Um, we're going to be. I think Napa is going to be my last festival for the year. Uh, and then we're going to take a we're going to take a break around the holidays for a little bit. Um, do what we got to do, and uh, hopefully we'll be back. Uh, I can't believe we're already being like, and we'll be back next year. I mean, we're yeah, already going. At, that's scary. It is, man. We've got almost four years going on on this. We'll be January thirty first, two thousand twelve. We'll mark four years of film snobbery. We'll be we'll be at that point working on year five. And we're almost close to the. Uh... What the three-year anniversary of Films Not Very Live, or the it's a couple of years, two yeah, two years, three years, two something years, like that. Yeah, years, something it'll be like on the two-year anniversary. Then we'll start year three. Yeah, yeah, wow, scary. That is, wow. I, anyone that's uh, before like you end this off, they cut the show off. Uh, anyone that's gonna be at Philly next weekend, see Nick live and I, go to the first time film festival. As Jerry would call it, it's it's Film Snobbery Live Live. Yes. Uh, anyone that's at or in Orlando or near Orlando uh, the following week, uh, come and see me and Nick at the Orlando Film Festival for Films Not Ready Live Live. Mm -hmm. uh, we'll be there for that whole week. And then uh, check Twitter and keep... Oh wait a minute! Red, Red Locker says I I'm in Ca I'm like in Cali can't go. Well you know what? In November I'll be in Napa Valley. I will be in Cali, motherfucker, and I'll probably actually be hanging out in San Francisco for a day or two with uh, a good friend of mine, Adria Richards, uh, who we've had on the show. She's a technology consultant and uh, and also a life coach. She's actually a really really cool person. Um, uh, I couldn't think of anyone better to uh, to to work with me on. Uh, my goals, my career, and all that, and she has. I mean, we we've actually uh, we we met years ago, and we kept in touch, and we we've, we've kind of you know counseled each other on on our various kind of uh, fears and and other stuff in our respective industries, and and uh, she's a real positive change, positive influence in in uh, my life and in what I do and stuff like that. I also have to do uh, while I'm talking about positive influences in my life, I do also want to go ahead and throw a quick shout out to uh, producer uh, John Paul Rice. Um, the producer for Mother's Red Dress. We just actually uh, were their first review up on our website, kind of mirroring uh, almost our first year. The third review we ever did was for their first movie, One Hour Fantasy Girl. And uh, now they're, you know, almost four years later, we're uh, the first review for their new movie, Mother's Red Dress. And happy to, yeah, I'm glad that their their uh, their premiere went off really well out in uh, L.A. and um, at the Downtown Independent. And uh, also, um, I just want to thank him because he sent me a book, <coughs> kind of like a self-help book, and uh, I've actually been starting to read it. And, um, you know, because, you know, I want to affect positive change on my life, and I, that's the only way I'm going to be able to affect positive change on others. And not to sound like a fucking pussy, but the fact of the matter is, is that, you know, you got to be comfortable with who you are, and you got to be out out there and uh, that's it you know and you know I'm starting to date again so that's kind of weird and you know and uh, that's mm, yeah I'm throwing all that out there You're not using the show to try to pick up female filmmakers. dude I've been trying to use the show to pick up female filmmakers like whoa but it just doesn't ever happen they're either they're either married or lesbian or just not into me so that's it <laughs> um, one more quick shout out uh, this Saturday night uh, if you live in or near Daytona Beach, or know anyone that lives down there, uh, Stuck Like Chuck will be screening my film. Uh, 
10 p.m., I believe, uh, at the uh, Cinematic. Let me get the exact, the, yeah, the Cinematic Theater uh, in, on Beach Street in Daytona Beach. Uh, going to have a screening followed by a Q&A via Skype, because fortunately I can't fly down there. But, uh, yeah, so check that out. Uh, we'll have, have the film finally on the big screen again after over a year just being on your computer screens. Yeah. Uh, Crystal Kenville says, God, I love wine. Please bring me back a nice bottle of red. If you like uh, good wine, you actually should definitely go to the the, uh, the the New Hampshire Film Festival in Portsmouth because they, uh, the Coppola wine, Francis Ford Coppola Wines is one of their sponsors, and uh, they, it's, it's actually really good wine. Um, I've had it both there, and I've had it down at the Orlando Film Festival as well. You stole our bottle. I did. I took our bottle. I was like, we had a bottle. It was like a prop on our t table, and I was just like, and that's mine. And uh, I drank it, and it was delightful. Actually, I brought it to a party so that I could drink it with a bunch of other people because that's how I am. Film snobbery shares. That's what it's all about. You win prizes. You get wine. You get booze. It's good. I don't know. Um, <laughs> so uh, so that's it, man. We are going to go ahead, and we're going to shut this show down for tonight. Um, we'll see you in a few weeks, and uh, that's which feels weird to say. And um, uh, that is all I've got for the show for tonight, I think. Uh, Jerry, anything else you want to add? Um, not really. If you want to see, follow me during those three weeks that we're off, uh, twitter.com slash getstuck or yep. jerrycavallaro.com. Yeah, and good luck, uh, uh, you guys, if you guys are lucky. Uh, you might see us, uh, whether it's through our, from our phones or however we can possibly work it out. We may do some broadcasting here or there, um, you know, just some little quick updates and stuff like that. Uh, Jerry always does I'm updates at the yeah, Orlando I'm Film try Festival. To do some so, daily yep. video updates yep. from so, my iPhone. So, that's it. So, uh, th night, everyone. Uh, we'll see you in Philly and, uh, and elsewhere as well. So, uh, check it out, and we'll see you guys when we see you.